Pyeongchang, South Korea. In a few days, the Olympic Winter Games will begin here. A celebration of great sport, supposedly. More doping tests than ever. The International Olympic Committee says that protecting clean athletes from cheaters is its highest priority. They want to avoid another scandal like in Sochi. The biggest doping fraud at the Olympic Games happened four years ago. The scandal involving Russia brought the anti-doping system to the cliff's edge. The promise was that afterwards, everything would get better. This film will show that the promise was not kept. Criminal doping schemes go well beyond Russia. The anti-doping system is wobblier than ever, just before the Olympics. Just how easy it is to get around was proven a few years ago by this man. Sergei Portugalov, a key figure in the Russian state-sponsored doping machine. Three years ago, in an ARD film, whistleblowers revealed with hidden film and audio recordings widespread doping in Russian sports, especially in track and field. One of the people pulling strings? This man, Sergei Portugalov. At the time, a highly respected doctor of sports medicine. Recordings with a hidden camera show, in reality, he was doping top athletes, selling them banned substances controlling their success. You responded really well to the drugs, as if someone had given you a turbo drive. In 2014, Portugalov was busted and received a lifetime worldwide ban. October 2017, we received documents from Russia. A file with emails and contracts. There can be only one conclusion. Portugalov is still active. Some emails are of particular interest. They concern a collaboration between Portugalov and a doctor in Switzerland. He agrees to carry out tests for Portugalov on humans with a substance developed in Russia. It's supposed to enhance performance, but we don't know if it's a doping drug. This is documented in a contract signed by both. The contract continues at least into 2017, two years after Portugalov had been revealed as a doping doctor. Bern in Switzerland, where the doctor has his clinic. Is he involved in doping practices? That's what we came to find out. We've decided to use a decoy and work with a hidden camera. The name of the doctor he will visit is known to the editorial team. We'll call him Dr. M. Posing as an athlete, our colleague tells him that he's an ambitious cross-country skier from Germany and wants to improve his performance. Astonishingly, the doctor is quite happy to talk about doping. He lets on that he knows pro cycling particularly well. I work with athletes every day. I've done a lot in Germany. So I know sport inside and out. I've worked with He's referring to a formerly successful German pro cycling team. So were you their team doctor? Yes. Do they take stuff? Yes, they all take stuff. Impossible to go without it. Is he just bragging? Our decoy is curious. Maybe you could help me with that. Can we do a blood analysis? I would suggest. Can I examine you briefly? Our decoy has his blood taken. The results are due at his next visit.
My informants have told me that this man, who is obviously considered an expert by a Russian doping doctor, has been known for his dubious practices for years, especially in professional cycling. A letter is meant to prove this. From the International Cycling Union, dated 2009, signed by the president, Pat McQuaid himself. It went to the public prosecutors in Switzerland. In it, McQuaid reports, a young athlete's close relative who was concerned because this doctor allegedly prescribed EPO growth hormone, insulin, and cortisone to athletes. It says the doctor carries out autologous blood transfusions for athletes would attest to a non-existent illness so that athletes would be able to take prohibited substances. His treatments were said to be carried out in Bern. This letter is about Dr. M. Nobody can tell me whether anyone pursued these tip-offs. The doctor continues to practice medicine. January 2018. Our would-be cross-country skier plans to find out for sure. How far will Dr. M go? The second appointment in Bern. Conspicuous in the doctor's office, many photos on the wall, personally signed by top athletes, some of them from Germany. Our undercover colleague now asks directly about doping, wanting to artificially raise his hemoglobin value. This helps performance. How do you raise the hemoglobin level? With EPO or testosterone, many don't know that with testosterone injected every two weeks, you can raise the hemoglobin level. That would definitely improve performance. Okay. How do you take the testosterone? You inject it into your arm or leg. It's up to you. It's definitely doable. I'd have to think about it. Yes, of course. Think about it. Not a problem. If you want to go ahead with Testo, I can show you how to take it. Then you can do it yourself. The doctor also says that there are no legal consequences for this in Switzerland. And then he gives our decoy a patient information leaflet so that he can read up on the proposed testosterone product. Now there is just one small step left until actual doping. Will the doctor in Bern deliver it? A few days ago, a third meeting with Dr. M. This time it's only about the testosterone. Would you give it to me? Yes, I can give you some. But I don't want to get in trouble at the border. No, with these small amounts, you won't. It isn't long until my race. Okay, then we should start in the second week in February. Inject it three times before the race. So you show me how to do it? And then I can do the other three by myself. Yes, exactly. That's what I mean, right. Now it's my turn to go to Switzerland. Not to see Dr. M, but the National Anti-Doping Organization. A few days ago, we confronted Anti-Doping Switzerland with our investigation. The organization's director is Matthias Kamba. We watch the hidden recordings made by our decoy. Definitely improve performance. Okay, how do you take the testosterone? You inject it into your arm or leg. It's up to you. It's definitely doable. He's risking everything, talking like this. He tells the athlete how to use stuff, that you need banned substances, that he has prescribed banned substances to top athletes. The doctor claims that it's not relevant in criminal terms. He's wrong about that. He should be worried about the sports promotion law. This is quite obviously a case for the public prosecutor. In Switzerland, if you prescribe, dispense, distribute or advise on the use of doping substances, you can be imprisoned for up to three years. Anti-doping Switzerland informed the public prosecutor after our interview. They confirmed that the doctor is now being investigated. The written request from the ARD doping editorial team about his practices goes unanswered by the doctor. So our supposed cross-country skier was able to begin a doping plan quite easily in the middle of Western Europe, just before the Olympics. It is all the more important then 
that the doping control system works well. It relies on these bottles, barrack kits as they're known. The closure is intended to securely seal athletes' urine samples. Impossible to open without destroying the cap. In the lab, just before doing the analysis, as it should be, to prevent tampering with samples. A documentary shows how to trick the system. Grigory Rodchenkov, the mastermind of Russian state-sponsored doping, explains how the Secret Service, the FSB, opened the sealed doping sample containers, replacing the urine of Russian dopers with clean samples. This FSB officer, he was responsible for the day when I gave closed berry kit, and after half an hour, I received it opened, and the cap and the bottle are the same, and I can phew, a little bit rinse and then pour and close like it's very good. I was, it's unbelievable how they could do this. This was named Operation Sochi Resultat. What happened in Sochi should never happen again. The manufacturer has made improvements and promises. The bottles are either destroyed or retain visible traces of tampering if any unauthorized attempt is made to open them. Is that true? The ARD doping editorial team wanted to know and started an experiment. October 2017, we're visiting glass expert Sven Lamek. He's trying something out for us. He simply cuts the glass. A glass saw like this can be found in any glass workshop. And as every expert in the field knows, a few well-placed cuts and glass shatters when it's hot enough. The cap intact. The way I see it, you can use the mechanism again once you get the glass bottle out of the lid. That makes it reusable. We've got the cap, that was easy. Now we get hold of replacement bottles. Easy for insiders to find. They're normal commercial laboratory bottles. We order a set of bottles with a particular screw thread. The next step, labels. We have copies made, including the seven digit test number of the original bottle. We're not showing exactly how we did it. We don't want to provide an instruction manual. The result is there within a few days. Copy on the left, original on the right. The bottles look identical. Will the original cap fit the replacement bottle? It does. The cap closes on a fake bottle with the original test number. We want to know whether it would be noticed in a doping test lab, so we travel abroad. We meet with an employee of an official doping test laboratory, which analyzes urine samples from all over the world for the World Anti-Doping Agency. This man opens urine samples every day. He's handled thousands of these bottles. He doesn't want to be recognized. We show him the bottles. He doesn't know which is the original and which is the fake. The lab technician says, I've looked at these for several minutes now, and I can't tell which one is original and which one is fake. Only when I tap the bottles against each other, there was a tiny difference in sound. But in the normal process, you wouldn't check the bottles that precisely. No one would notice. We showed our copies to several experts from testing labs in different countries all confirmed. They would regard the copies as original in their day-to-day -day work. The fakes would not have been noticed. The door is wide open for manipulation. 
For years, Barrick kits have been used for doping tests worldwide. Specifically, this type of bottle at the Rio Olympics, for recent European football championships, for big events and many types of sport. Counterfeit bottles have not been known to date, or were they simply not detected? Nobody can say for sure that what we were easily able to do has not been done by others, too. But now, everything is supposed to be even more secure. Introduced just a few weeks before the Winter Games in Pyeongchang, a supposedly even more secure type of urine sample container with a special safety cap, with a hologram, hardly visible, more security, the manufacturer promises. In December, we commissioned a specialist. She doesn't want to be recognized, so we disguised the scenes. The new safety cap is much more simply constructed than thought, she says. I have not found any insurmountable safety features in the lid. Faking this one shouldn't be hard. Let me put it this way. Faking a banknote, that's difficulty level 10. This lid here, that's maybe a 0.3. Our expert will try to re-engineer the cap. Again, we will not show exactly how she does so. A few days ago, it was ready. The faked cap with the hologram. We screw the cap onto one of our replacement bottles, although they're slightly different to the new barrack kit. But it's hardly noticeable. And the bottles fit the new caps. With this completely copied kit, our expert can now fake any other kit. Just tell me a number, and I can get it onto a blank kit in just 12 minutes. Both on the cap and on the bottle. None of this is a problem for experts, and experts are a dime a dozen. The result? A pretty accurate kit of the latest generation. Now we want to know whether staff in the WADA-accredited testing lab notice that the caps are fake. The result? Nobody figured it out. In other words, if you have these blank kits, you can manipulate doping samples, like so. After the doping test, every athlete knows the kit number of their sample. Forgers can sample a blank kit in 12 minutes, pour in clean urine, Switch the original and the copy in the lab or somewhere along the way. A manipulation like this would be easier than in Sochi. One hand movement and everything is switched. We sent a 3D scan of the latest bottle to a glass factory in China and received an offer right away. We can order 150,000 bottles immediately for 14 US cents a piece. Add in labels and caps as copies. Per bottle, the counterfeit costs only about six euros. It would have been easy for us to copy tens of thousands of kits. Manipulation on a massive scale? Possible. All of this is disturbing enough. How is it possible that doping tests, the core of the fight for clean sports, are so badly protected? Manipulations like those in Russia our child's play. A few weeks before this broadcast, I received a message that could bring the whole system crashing down, if it's accurate. A phone call. The caller is upset. Others will follow. Experts from abroad who carry out doping tests. Once again, it's about the bottles, but the original ones this time the ones that are used worldwide, including at the Olympic Winter Games. Supposedly, they should be sealed after collecting the urine sample and can only be opened by destroying the cap in the lab. My callers tell me confidentially, some bottles can simply be unscrewed by anyone. After a few hours in a refrigerator, the bottles have to stay closed. This is the nuts and bolts of the doping control system. 
The urine can be swapped like in Sochi. That's completely crazy. And just before the Olympics. If this is true, then manipulations would be easy, an end to the doping control system. 60,000 of these kits are already in use, including for the pre-Olympic tests. We decide to get to the bottom of this, get hold of some original bottles. We fill them with a liquid. The manufacturer, whose slogan is Feel Safe, has just published a new instruction on how to seal the bottle. Turn the cap gently until it can be turned no further. Try to turn the cap anti-clockwise. Try to lift the cap off. Turn the bottle upside down. We follow these instructions exactly. Then we store 24 new original bottles in the fridge. The fridge stays closed for 72 hours. After 72 hours, three days, we took the bottles out of the fridge. None should open. Our experiment begins. First, it all looks fine. Tightly sealed. As they should be. No chance for potential cheaters to switch out urine. Until now. A bottle that is supposed to be sealed, opened with no trouble. A bit later, another one. Later, we repeat the experiment with other bottles. Some can be opened again and again. And it gets worse. Anything is possible with these bottles, which World Sport relies on. We manage to reseal two of the already opened bottles, so they remain sealed without problems. No doping control lab in the world would ever notice that the bottles had been opened in between. Contaminate samples, Replace urine, anything's possible. No one would notice. People in the labs tell us that even frozen bottles containing frozen samples can be opened. In other words, long-term storage for retesting at Olympic Games would be invalid with these bottles. The World Anti-Doping Agency evades our question about the vulnerability of the new bottles refers to the manufacturer. The company, Berlinger, knows about the problem in the labs. They blame it on the mishandling of the bottles. The well-known sports lawyer, Michael Lena, has often represented athletes in doping proceedings. We show him the pictures of our samples. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Never. I'm speechless. You just can't imagine a massive cock-up like that happening. 
I can't prove anything with that. Of all the things I can do, I just can't convict a doping offender. And what really scares me is that it must have been known about. If people knew, then they have no credibility whatsoever. What does it mean in the fight for clean sport? You can answer that one in a few words. To be quite clear, it's over now. Anyone who sees this and knows about it will say, OK, I can do what I want. My lawyer is going to get me off. And if you know that the bottles will be used at the Olympic Winter Games in Pyeongchang? Doping control system, Olympics career, it all won't work. Forget it. Less than 24 hours before airing, the World Anti-Doping Agency suddenly, after a long silence, admits to possible problems with the bottles. Yet they say the manufacturer can't find anything wrong. They say they're going to investigate. Probably too late for the Winter Games in Pyeongchang. Reliable doping tests at the Olympics? Just a farce now. The ones whose job is clean sport have squandered their most precious possession, credibility. <laughs>